The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, episode 803, for Monday, February 24th, 2020. <laughs> Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek. Uh, welcome back. If it's not your first episode, we are the show where we take questions, your questions, sometimes our questions, tips, your tips, sometimes ours. Cool stuff found. You're getting the drill here. We share it. We answer the questions. We do whatever we can to make sure that each and every one of us, and yes, that includes us, your hosts, learn at least five new things every single time we get together, which is generally once a week. That's the goal anyway. Sponsors for this episode include Zapier.com slash MGG, Z-A-P-I-E-R.com slash MGG, MacSales.com, other world computing in other, in other words, and Linode.com slash MGG. We'll talk a little bit more in depth about each of those throughout the episode. But for now, uh, here, at least as far as you know, in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here, still in fearful Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. All right, John, let's uh, let's dive right in. We've got some quick tips and and I'm sure we, you and I have things to share throughout the episode. We'll start with Scott. Scott found a cool thing in the share sheet of iOS. He was going to share an article for future reference because he likes to save a copy um, because links or articles can change or disappear in the future. And he's totally right about that. But when he did it on iOS, he tapped the little share button and then he tapped right at the top. So it would say in the case of sharing a web page, it would show a little thumbnail of the web page at the very top. This is in iOS 13 or iPad OS 13. And then it kind of has the title and the site where it came from. And just right there. So this is, Above where it's showing you your shortcuts to, you know, your most frequently or recently sent to, you know, message recipients right next to that, right above that. Um, but right next to the site name, it says options. And if you tap that, you can choose what type of file you'll be sending as. And uh, in his example, there were four options, automatic PDF a reader PDF. So that's a PDF of the reader view of that web page, which is pretty cool or a web archive. Uh, and then, and then obviously you can send it off, but that's pretty cool. And so he, you know, in, in his example for us, he changed it to PDF document and boom, there it is. Now it's PDF. Pretty cool. Thank you for sharing that with us, Scott. I had, it's, it's the beauty of quick tips. It's been right there. I've never noticed it and certainly never tapped on it so thank you for uh for sharing that with us pretty good stuff man i like it i like it i like it i like it pretty good right john yeah i think it's new yeah it's new in thir- uh, is it I'm new sure is that new in 13 us- okay <clears throat> i'm sure i would have noticed that before. uh i don't or know I, ha- I hadn't noticed it until scott pointed it out so i don't know, I don't know. maybe <laughs> all right uh Patrick has uh, another one for us. He says, I've been using this for years, but I've never seen anybody talk or write about it. Say one has an email, for example, a medical license or whatever. And not only do we want it, uh, not want it in our receipts folder, but we want it in our, say, medical data folder from Apple Mail. If one holds, oh, actually, sorry, I'm misreading his note here. There's a lot of double negatives going on. Uh, he wants it in both his receipts folder in Apple mail and his medical data folder. So he wants it double filed in these two folders. Okay. He says, if one holds down the command key and drags it to both folders, it will show up and be deposited. Thusly, he says, I know we can do that with rules, but this is for those on the fly moments when one wants something that might contain important attachment or whatever, and you want it in several different folders. So yeah, that's pretty good. Thanks, Patrick. I never even thought about that. I never even thought about doing it with a rule, but certainly nice to be able to do it on the fly. So thanks for sharing that. It's pretty good, right? Pretty good, John. Indeed. Yeah. 
Um, Todd. Todd, we were talking in episode 801 a couple of weeks ago about how I finally, after whatever decade plus with decade plus, I should say, with uh, Mac OS 10 and system preferences, I finally r- realized that I needed to sort it alphabetically because that's the only way I'll ever find anything in there. I, I just can't seem to have any muscle memory of where things are other than a couple of them. So I started sorting it alphabetically. And Todd said, uh, if you have it in your dock, either because it's there or because it's open and you right click on it, you also get a list of your system preferences in alphabetical order. And so that can make it very quick to uh, to get to the one you want without even having to go to that main screen that may or may not be sorted the way you want. So I thought that was pretty good. And then. Similarly, Lewis reminds us, he says, I don't use the alphabetical order in system preferences, but I do customize it by going opening system preferences, going to the view menu and choosing customize to hide most of the preferences and only leave the ones that I use a lot. He says, I can always get the alphabetical list in the menu. He says, uh, but for example, I use trackpad settings once when set up a new machine at most and that's it. He's like, so I hide trackpad settings and I really clean up system preferences. I kind of like this idea. I'm going to have to experiment with it uh, because it is always there in the in the view menu. You know, you can always get to them there in system preferences, too, which perhaps would be an even better way. Just like, boom, you know, there you go. But uh, but filtering down that view to just your favorites and thinking of the that view is not everything, but as favorites, like how often do you go into language and region? Um, most of us probably not all that often, but uh, but something like general or network. Yeah, I want that there all the time because I'm in there all the time. So, yeah, hmm, I like this. What do you think, John? And s- speaking of right clicking on things, I yes. found this. So, yeah, after that tip about right clicking and, you know, seeing your list of system preferences and all that, I'm like, hmm, I wonder what else you right click on in the doc that'll uh, show you something interesting. So there's a standard list of things that it'll show for things in the doc, but some programs add something extra. And here's one that adds something extra and it's it's replicated in uh you can do it in both macOS and iOS. Uh, if you right click on the Safari icon, you'll see two choices, new window and new private window. Nice. The thing is, if you go to Safari on iOS and you hold down on the two squares, I'm not sure what you're supposed to call that. But if you hold down on that, you'll get the same thing. New tab or new private tab. So. Huh. Yeah, 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 sure. And on iOS, you get one more option if you if you long push, I guess is what we're calling that now. Mm-hmm. Um, you get show reading list too in uh, in iOS. I'm not seeing that on the Mac when I right click on it, but I definitely get that on my iPhone. I get I get new tab, new private tab, show bookmarks, and show reading list. So that's pretty good. I like this. See, see, this is this is we're, we're all about efficiency here. And that actually is why I want to talk about our first sponsor, Zapier, John. We have been using Zapier here for a very long time. What Zapier is, is it's it's an it's an online service and you would go to Zapier.com slash MGG to get your 14 day free trial. And I think of it as the glue that ties together all the other online services that I use. So what do I mean by this? Well, let's say every time there's a new uh, episode of a show, I want it to appear in Slack, right? And so I can use Zapier to tie that together. It can parse the, the show's feed. And then when something comes in, boom, it puts it into my Slack group so that I'm okay, great. That episode's out. Now we can go and, and grab the, you know, timestamps or whatever out of it and everything's good to go. For Mac Geekab, we use it to uh, track your premium subscriptions. I used to have to go and manually go through all the emails and parse out the the you know your name and your city that you're from and then put that on a list. And I would put it on a spreadsheet. And I did this for years. And I already had a Zapier membership, and so I feel a little embarrassed that I didn't think about this right out of the gate. But eventually I did, and I thought, wait a minute, 
I can link Zapier with our e-commerce engine. So I did that. I can also link it with Google Sheets. So I did that. And now anytime an order happens, boom, it populates a Google Sheet with exactly and only the data that I want. And it all happens automatically. So I can just go to the Google Sheet and I have everything where I need it and we're good to go. So you can do things like this. It really the world is your oyster with Zapier, and that's the beauty of it. No more wasting time on tasks that you know could be automated because that's what Zapier is here to do. And uh, you, so you can join us and, you know, another four and a half million people who are saving an average of 40 hours per month by using Zapier. I believe that it saves so much time that you, you the nice part about it is once you get it set up, you sort of forget that it's doing anything for you, except all your stuff happens. So. Right now and through the end of this month, try Zapier free by going to our special link that I mentioned, zapier.com slash MGG. That's Z-A-P-I-E-R dot com slash MGG for your free 14 day trial. Zapier.com slash MGG. Our thanks to Zapier for sponsoring this episode. Go check it out. Our second sponsor is Linode because you're going to need a server someday. You're going to want a server someday. Having a server to play with can be fun and you can use it for your business or even your home stuff. Linode makes this super easy because of their cloud interface. Certainly, sometimes it's fun to use the terminal for some of us. But even for those of us that it's fun sometimes, it's not fun all the times. And then, of course, there's lots of folks out there that it's never fun for. No worries. Linode will let you use the terminal and you can, you know, SSH into your server if you want. No problem. Or you can just use their cloud manager and their cloud manager lets you set up your server without ever even knowing that the command line exists. It's awesome. You go to, uh, you know, you say you want a WordPress server. You just tell it you want a WordPress server. It asks you a couple of questions like, what do you want your username to be? And, you know, what's the name of your website or something? And then, boom, WordPress is set up. You don't have to know that it just configured Apache, MySQL, PHP for you. You want a VPN server? You run your own VPN? Sure. You, want to, you don't have to know how to do that. It just sets it up for you. It's pretty awesome. And there's all kinds of things. If you've thought of it, they probably have thought of it, too, and they've got it configured. But if they haven't, all you do is ask them, and they might be able to set it up for you because chances are somebody else wants what you want. Very, very cool stuff. All their stuff is on SSDs natively. They've got a 40 gigabit network uh, that everything's plugged into and you can pick from any of their 10 worldwide data centers. Go check it out. Go to linode.com slash MGG. By going there, you'll start with a $20 credit. And I'll tell you, their least expensive server is just five bucks a month. So you get four months for free on us. So check it out. Linode.com slash MGG to get your $20 credit and get started today. Our thanks, of course, to Linode for sponsoring the episode. All right, John. Um, David has a problem with Apple's podcast app, and we're going to try and help him. Because what David says is, uh, why does the new podcast app on the Mac keep unsubscribing me from various shows? I download through my Mac and sync with my phone and an iPod, which I listen to in the car. At least half a dozen times in the past couple of months, I've noticed that I'm not seeing new episodes of one podcast or another. When I look in the app, it will sometimes say that it has stopped pulling down new episodes because I, quote unquote, haven't listened in a while. Uh, this is in spite of the fact that I sync my devices every week or so. I have to, to stay current on things like Mac Geek Gab. At most, I might get an extra episode or two stacked up, but I always manage to listen within that time frame. It does seem like the podcast app might have to be manually launched to do its job. I think if it isn't launched, it won't pull new episodes in the background, even if the music app or the finder are open. So I make a point to run it every few days for that very reason. Well, this time, Mac Geek Gab was the victim. I noticed today I hadn't heard the latest episode, and after a sync, I still couldn't listen. So I checked the app and sure enough, it said I hadn't listened in a while and it had stopped downloading new ones. Do you have any thoughts on how to deal with this? I don't like the app second guessing me. I shouldn't have to keep reassuring it that I want to listen to shows to which I have subscribed. Yeah, man, um, I run into this, too. This, quite frankly, has always been a problem with Apple's podcast pod catching apps. Right. Uh, it was a problem with iTunes. It's, it's an issue with uh, podcasts on iOS and, of course, you know, now podcasts on the Mac suffers the same fate or depending on how you look at it has the same feature. I think they think they're being helpful, but 
uh, as you found, it's a little overzealous. At least I, I, I agree that it's a little overzealous. So I don't use Apple's podcast app for, for that reason. Um, I use, I sort of go back and forth between two apps. Overcast is one and pocket cast is the other. I kind of, I kind of like pocket cast a little bit better, but they're both really popular. And so I, a, I want to stay abreast of them for what we do here at Mac Ecab so that when you folks write in, I, you know, have some working knowledge of, of the apps that you folks are using. Um, but I also, you know, it, it's kind of interesting to sort of bounce back and forth and, and mess with them. But I, those are those are two of them that I would recommend. There are plenty others that are also awesome. But a third party podcast app might might be the the answer for you. So and Dave Ginsburg in the chat room points out uh, that he uses Downcast um, and you can join us in the chat room at com slash stream. But um, and yeah, Downcast is is another one that I that I have on my phone and I use sort of interchangeably with these others uh, for sure. I don't. In fact, I don't know why I didn't. It just didn't pop into my mind. I guess I'd I guess I'd use the other two most recently frequently. But Downcast is is definitely the third that um, that I use. And and yeah. So there you go. Yeah. What do you What do you use, John? Uh. Eh, Apple's thing usually. You do okay. Yeah. It's annoying because I'm looking in music right now, and you would think I agree with you. I I I always hated that it's like, eh, you don't want to listen to this anymore, right? <laughs> it's yeah, like, dude, stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I don't see why they don't make that a preference. Hmm. Uh, you, you know, and they might be, um, but I, I I've never, I, quite frankly, I've never looked for it. I I think I gave up on Apple's stuff a while back because I. You know, I, I don't listen um, every day. I don't have a, a normal like I don't have a commute other than the, you know, the walk across the driveway, which was treacherous today, by the way, because it's it, it was a little icy out there and now it's snowing on top of the ice. So you don't see where the ice is. So you got to be careful. Uh, but um, but other than that, I don't have a commute. So I, I listen to podcasts sort of at, at sporadic times, like when I'm driving to, you know, go see my chiropractor or, you know, go to the store or whatever. That's sort of when I, I will listen to podcasts, but, um, but yeah. Yeah. So what? Do you have ice skates you should put on your skates. Oh yeah. Dude, it, it skate to work. It, it, there have been some days where that would have been the safe choice for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's dangerous out. You know, when you get like a little dusting of snow over the, the problem is the entire driveway isn't icy. It's just that there are patches that are. And when there's no snow, you see them and you either walk around them or know to walk like a penguin when you're, you know, on the ice. Right. But um, but if you don't see it, you just start walking and you can like it can be a real problem. I hurt myself pretty bad a couple of years ago. I I I thought I'd broken my rib, but I didn't. It was the most pain I've ever been in my life. I bruised my diaphragm from falling on uh on the ice actually doing that walking across the the driveway so it was it was crazy it was a bad couple of days so be careful out there folks was that from hill street blues what is this who's dog breath yeah let's be careful out there yeah mm -hmm. all right uh okay joe has a question so hopefully that's that's helpful there uh joe says um something strange just started happening with one of my IMAP email accounts. And it's, it's one that's hosted with GoDaddy. I don't think that's relevant, but, um, but I share that just in case uh, he says, when I delete an email from my Mac using Apple mail, it deletes on my iPhone. I see that change reflected, but the other way around doesn't work. I can delete it from my iPhone, but it still stays on my Mac. And if I open up my mail workspace on GoDaddy, I see that when I delete an email on my Mac, it deletes from the server, but not when I delete from my iPhone. So this is a bit interesting. Um, my first thought is if you go on the phone to the settings app, go to passwords and accounts, go to the affected account. If you have more than one and you probably do go to advanced there's two options you want to look at in there. So it's settings, passwords and accounts, your account advanced. And then on that advanced screen, there's two things you want to look at for this. One is deleted mailbox. Make sure 
that that mailbox actually exists because essentially what happens when you delete a message is it moves it from one mailbox in, you know, let's say your inbox to another, say your trash mailbox, but it could move it say to your inbox. If you have inbox set for deleted mailbox, then it's not going to move it anywhere. And and then so making sure deleted mailbox is your trash mailbox, preferably the trash mailbox on the server. Uh, but if you have reason to have it somewhere else, that's fine. And then you want to check the option for move discarded messages into because you want this to, to be using that deleted mailbox. You can set iOS to not delete things, but instead archive them and by default. And so that's where that's where this option comes up, right? So you go into your account and and you can either have it move discarded messages into deleted mailbox or archive mailbox. And uh, and you just want to make sure that that, you know, it's that it's doing what you want it to be doing. So this is the first place I would check. Uh, you know, there, there's probably other things to look at. This may not be the end all be all solution for Joe, but. Uh, oh, well, I'll give you another place you should absolutely check. Yes, sir. Um, where is this on the Mac side? And on the Mac side, you want to go to mail. Preferences, accounts, and then you'll see your, your, a, a list of your email accounts. Um, and if you click on one of them, you will see uh, to the right, there's a tab, Mailbox Behaviors. That's basically the same thing that you're seeing on the iOS side that Dave just talked about. Check what that is set to and make sure it matches what's on the phone. And I would suspect they don't. Yeah, that that's a great. Yeah. Use your Mac in, in Joe's case, because his Mac is behaving the way he wants it to sort of mirroring those settings between the two. That's a great idea. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Cool. Yeah, some can get kind of weird. Like, for example, Gmail uh, preferences the mailbox name with the word Gmail in brackets. I don't know why they do that. Or at least when I set up my Gmail, that's that's what I had to do. Yeah, because Gmail sort of has a fake IMAP implementation tacked in front of your Gmail box. So they essentially take Gmail's labels concept and turn those into IMAP mailboxes. So it can get a little wonky. That's why that happens. It doesn't happen with everything. It only happens with, with mailboxes that you create from your Mac. If you create them from the, if, if you create them as labels on the Gmail side, then they don't have that. But yeah, it gets a little, gets a little wonky. Yeah, but it's good. You know, that's good. All right. Um, I have, so take things in a slightly different direction for us here. Apple recently announced that they were joining something called the Fido Alliance in the interest of security. Essentially, it, it, some of this has been couched as Apple is this alliance, this Fido alliance. So by Apple joining it, Apple is looking to get rid of or significantly deprioritize the concept of just using username and password uh, or passwords in general. So, John, you dug into this a little bit. Can you first let's let's sort of go briefly over what this what the idea behind this Fido alliance is replacing password only logins with what and here's the thing so um most people consider uh, there are three factors that can be used to uh, to authenticate with a system and they are what you know which could be a password okay what you have which is something like uh a token or, you know, some, it could be a USB device or it could be something else, but it's something that you have is the other factor. And then the third is what you are and that's biometrics. So by using, biometrics, you mean, I mean, uh, could be face ID, could be touch ID. Um, some unique thing about you that's physical. Okay. And and this you know, what so it could be this, a could be a retina yeah. you know retina scan uh, fingerprint um, again face ID is a form of of biometrics because, sure 
And so what you have could be, you're right, that it could be a token like we might get with our, you know, overly secure bank accounts or something like that. But it, it also could be like the two factor codes that you can generate on your phone or in your one password app or something like that. Right. That falls mm -hmm. loosely into that category of what you have. Correct. Right. OK, so Fido is is looking to prioritize the the latter two of those things and deprioritize the former is that that essentially what we're what we're talking about here with it's basically with the, taking passwords out of the equation got it okay all right that's simple all right so but what you've described is nothing new at least in concept right i mean these these things we've talked about them on this show for 10 plus years they've certainly existed even longer than that Again, conceptually, and there's even some things in the market. In fact, you were talking about one that you have, right? Like a um, what's the name of it? The thing that that you were messing with recently? Oh, so actually, yes. So somebody has. Um, uh, all right, so we got the Fido Alliance, and with the Fido Alliance, one thing that they're creating—I don't think it's the only thing they're creating—but it's a new standard called Web Authn. W e b a u t h n. Got it. Okay. And. That has to be baked into your browser, the, the ability to do that. It's not built in. Now, you may ask yourself, gee, has, has uh, you know, who's, who's doing this? And the thing is, almost every major browser supports it. Um, in one of the articles that we had here, um, so Apple was doing stuff behind the scenes here. So the information I got is from a ZDNet article actually says, in 2018, Apple's WebKit browser team added experimental support for web authen. Oh, OK. OK. And then in December 2019, Apple added native support for FIDO compliant security keys like the Yubi key. Got to, it. Uh, Safari. OK, so this is this is a thing that Apple hasn't just joined the alliance in anticipation of future support. They've joined the alliance and they are supporting this, which is great. Correct. Now, okay. one device that lets you play with this. But yeah, when the article said like the Yubi key, I'm like. Oh, wait a second. I got one of those. They, they, were, they were handing them out like candy at a CES. Ah, got it. Okay. <laughs> so I got one of their latest ones. It's the uh, YubiKey 5 NFC, because it also will talk to your phone using NFC, which uh, isn't that cool. Uh, okay. Um, but it can be used uh, as a uh, web authen token. And... So I'm like, oh, okay, well, let me, let me, uh, let me go to the page. And sure. uh, if you go to demo.yubico.com, there's a few things there that let you demonstrate, uh, let you check the functionality of the various devices. Right. And one of right. them is test web on that. So I'm like, oh, okay, let me, let me try it. So, you know, went to the page, got the uh, device, plugged it into my uh, anchor adapter because it's USB A, not okay. USB C. Or sure. At least the one they gave yeah, me of course. Is USB A. Of course. And what it does is uh, basically it, it will it, you plug it in and it's like, oh, hey, I see you and uh, I'm going to register this. And then let's go to the next page. And uh, let me tell you that I, again, see your your device and it worked. So it, it, it's not a full deployment, but it, sure. it demonstrated the fact that this can be used as a uh, and they actually say on their page, register and authenticate a USF slash FIDO2 key using WebAuthent. OK, so it probably will work that 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 sounds like a a standard of sorts. So it doesn't have to be a YubiKey, although, of course, they would prefer that you use a YubiKey because that's what they sell. But that makes sense. Yeah. OK. All right. Right. So, so if you want to play with this yourself, uh, one way would be to get yourself a, a YubiKey, which there are probably other reasons that you want to get it too. The, the other nice thing about this particular device is that it can look like a smart card to Mac OS. So I can actually use this same device to actually log in to my, uh, my Mac. Uh, interesting. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So it's definitely the, what you have, um, part of the equation here. And you can, this is realizing you can use a YubiKey with like your password managers, like one password or LastPass. I know both support YubiKey. Um, oh yeah, there, there's a, I forget, I'll see if I can find it, but, but they have a list of all the people that support them and it's, it's really long. <laughs> okay. All right. So, that, but that's pretty cool. Like the, the, like this is a thing that you can use and I'm guessing you'll probably start using yours with, with LastPass, right? Cause you 
still you still use LastPass? Yeah, right. Uh, yes, yeah. I tried it once with their prior model and was never never able to get it to quite hmm. work. And actually, the one that I had before, which was the YubiKey Four, is actually deprecated. So got it. Okay. All right. So all right. Pro- only problem is if you lose your key, then you know. Now, now things get interesting. All right. So, okay. So we know, yes. we understand the nuts and bolts. The question is like this, like you pointed out, the YubiKeys existed for a long time. Other things have existed. YubiKey is probably the most well-known consumer facing version of this so far. But my thought was, okay, now that Apple is joined up with this, you know, Apple has had a long history of taking security and making it convenient right because i i always sort of pointed out that that you get to you get to pick right it's a continuum you get to pick ultimate security or ultimate convenience and the example i like to use is well you know do you want to have doors on your house right forget about locks and any of that stuff do you want doors and windows because not having doors and windows really makes your house way more secure But it also is terribly inconvenient because you can't get in or out. So, okay, let's back off of that. Let's add some doors, but maybe we'll put locks on them. And, you know, that that's sort of a a nice sort of overstated example of that continuum. We've had this, though, and Apple has been really good at this. Touch ID was the you know, was a certainly a convenient way of adding some level of of security to your phone face id depending on your point of view arguably even more convenient uh, i think for most of us it's way more convenient than touch id so uh now that apple has joined this my first thought was okay well we've had this and it's existed in the fringes even with yubikey that's still the fringes you know it's existed in the fringes for a very long time it's never really made its way into, you know, the the common culture. But, boy, it sure seems like Apple might be the right ones to pull that into. What do you think about that? Like, right? Um, well, you got to look at who is playing in this market right now and why they're playing in this market. From what I can see, it's good that Apple is joining the club because... I think it's good they're joining the club because they're just making user experience better. Because as as the group points out, passwords suck. Right. Oh, <laughs> From a security for, standpoint, yeah, because, you know, people use the same one on different sites and, you know, people, you know, will hack systems and download the entire password database. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Whereas, yeah. whereas in this case, there is no password. Right. And from what I could read about the mechanics, what's actually happening is you're actually uh, this is actually using public key cryptography as part of the solution here. And from what I could read of uh, I'll have to read up more. But from what I could tell, what happens is when you go to a site, your your gizmo or your computer, I guess, generates a key pair. And then your public key is actually. You. Okay. Yeah. Or or it's used as part of the discussion to secure things. Got it. Okay. All right. And that's a good thing because the thing is a, a public key, it doesn't matter. It's public. So it doesn't matter if somebody has it because they're not going to get anything because they need the corresponding private key, which you had hopefully securely generated or your device has. Your, your device has it. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. I just, I feel like, you know, Apple, we already have a lot of these devices, you know, on our persons for other reasons. And I think that's that's the key to this is like we want to have our phones with us. Now, it could be argued that having our phone be the key might not be the right thing because we're using our phones sort of as the gateway to all of these things. So maybe we want another key. But what about your watch? What about even your AirPods or some future iteration of AirPods like, you know, Apple's sort of well, not sort of Apple's all in on wearables. So it seems to me like a wearable key and perhaps a wearable that is not just a key so that you actually want to remember to wear it and have it with you. You know, the Apple Watch really feels like of all of Apple's current products. Apple, the Apple watch feels like the one to me that's like, oh yeah, this could be like this, this. Well, you can already, uh, I still don't have an Apple watch. I'll get one someday, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah. Maybe the, maybe this is the year for me. But, All right. Yeah. But you can use your Apple Watch to unlock your Mac, right? Correct. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. And it's what? Is it using Bluetooth or something? But it's proximity to the computer that will unlock the computer. Right? That's right. Yep. And it just happens automatically. Um, if you set it up to happen automatically and, and you have to opt into that for sure. Uh, but but yeah, when I open up my laptop, I only have it on my laptop. I don't have it on my Mac in the office. Um, actually, I guess I do. Yeah, I do have it on my Mac in the office. But anyway, when it happens, I just feel a little tap on my wrist and it's just telling me, hey, by the way, I just unlocked your Mac. So it only works. It's very secure. Well, fairly secure, I will say. It only works if your watch is on your wrist and already previously unlocked. So it's not just like if somebody grabs your watch and you know waves it near your Mac, it's going to open. No, like you've, you've already got to be in that mode. So, yeah. That's right. Good. So there's, uh, but now I, I, you know, I, I just thought about it. So one, I'm like, well, you know, YubiKey of course is in the market because they make devices that speak this authentication language. Mm. Um, Apple's play is that they make devices that could potentially be used as a token or an yeah. authenticator because you, you I'm assuming, I'm assuming, I'm assuming, I'm assuming or technically I think you could use either touch ID or face ID on your phone to authenticate to the computer. Right. I mean, that would be my thought. Yeah. I don't know if so everybody that's what, heard that's why you. I, you just echoed in the strangest way possible in my ears, but it only lasted hmm. for like a second. It was really, I think everybody heard it. So there you go. That was, that was the, the audio God celebrating this segment. So yeah. All right, cool. This yeah. is great. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see where this, um, where this goes. Cool stuff. Um, I mentioned during the Zapier read, uh, our ad read, our premium contributor, <laughs> easy for me to say premium contributors and how we like to acknowledge all of you during the show. It's been a little while since we've done that. Frankly, it's th the only reason has been we've had so much content to go through that um, I, I, I keep sort of skipping it and I, I don't want to skip it today. So uh, our premium program is available at, at MacGeekUp.com slash premium. We've mentioned it several times. We always try to mention it and it is. Op, it's optional, completely optional. Uh, it's for those of you that want to and can support the show directly. Uh, certainly listening to the show, contributing your your stuff, visiting our sponsors, all of that truly, truly helps. Uh, you know, without all of that, the show doesn't happen. But quite frankly, without those of you contributing on the premium side, the show also doesn't happen. It's It really is uh, sort of a, a a mix of all of these things that makes it possible for us to continue doing this in what is our what fifteenth year almost here, which is pretty freaking awesome. So uh, we have two basic plans, really three. One is that you can just contribute any amount you want as a one time thing and 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 be done with it, or you can contribute on a regular basis. So on the monthly, uh, yeah, the monthly plan, which is defaults to ten dollars a month, although there's some of you that choose to contribute more. Uh, we would like to thank Tony from San Francisco, Frederick from Nashville, Robert from Columbiana, Joseph from Marietta, James from Melville, Jeff from Chesterton, Clive from Burgess Hill, Scott from Bourbonnaise, David from Mount Prospect, Barry from hopefully at home with his family, but you never know where Barry is. Michael from Robbins, Ken from Honolulu, Frank from Tunbridge, John from Wake Forest, Santiago from Palm City, John from Sinking Spring, Jim from San Jose, Dave from Saugerties, Jeffrey from West Haven, Timothy from Hendersonville, Bob from Lepeche, Tim from Des Moines, Philip from Tucson, Chris from Chorleywood, Michael from Mission Hills, Ari from Kensington, Joe from El Dorado, Jay from Long Valley, James from San Antonio, Bob from Austin and Working Smarter for Mac users, Peter from Auburn, Abdullah from Reistertown, Reisterstown, Scott from Portland, Neil from West Hartford, Nick from Mount Clemens, Mark from Milford, Paul from Fishers, Ward from Mesa, Luann from Albuquerque, and Jason from Charlestown. I know it's a long list. It's been a little while since we've done this, and I wanted to make sure we got uh, we got everybody in. That's only half of you, though, because we other have to thank are the folks that are choosing to contribute twice a year, once every six months. Uh, again, by default, that's twenty five dollars. Although, as you'll hear, some folks choose to contribute more. So our thanks go on that plan to the uh, to these folks, Jeffrey from Alamogordo, Richard from Sands Point, Karen from Chagrin Falls, Robert from Pointsbury, Pontsbury, sorry, 
Joe from Kingsley, Kurt from Princeton, Warren from Thompson Station, Terrence from Avon Lake, Brett H., Antonio B., both of them so early uh, long and longtime contributors that we don't have their uh, addresses on file, and that's okay. Barry from Delray Beach, Peter from Bayside, Richard from Melbourne, Thomas from Shoreview, Chuck from Boulder at $50 every six months, Russell from Marblehead, Stacy from Pine Valley, Richard from Brooklyn, Anders from Vasteras, Phil from Santa Fe, Kenneth from New Lambton, Drew from San Diego, John from Ypsilanti, Larry from Irvine, Deborah from Houston, Paul from Danville, Lyndon from Seven Oaks, Michael from Wake Forest, Charles from Kobe, Gary from McKee's Rocks, Thomas from Chicago, Keith from Kirby Cross, Chuck from Mechanicsburg, James from Charlotte, Dimitri from Moscow, Thomas from Sacramento, David from Farmington Hills, Michael from Milwaukee, Harry from Durham, Kevin S., Richard from Daniel Island, Elliot from Brookline, Jeff from North Belmore, Margaret from Waukegan, Paolo from Manteca, Peter from Sudbury, Joshua O., Louis Michel from St. Laurent, James from Port Alberni, Peter from Rochester, David from Seabrook, Scott from Calabasas at $60 every six months, and Mark from Panama City at $100 every six months. Thanks to all of you. Thank you so, so much for all the support and help and everything. It really, like I said, makes a huge, huge difference for what we're able to do here. And it just really it makes it possible for us to do what we do. So thank you. All right. Again, MacGeekab.com slash premium. Okay. Now uh, we've got some tips and some cool stuff found. Let's go with the cool stuff found first. In show 801, John, we talked about all kinds of different uh, things, including um, things to manage and track subscriptions. Uh, We've sort of I think we had answered most of that, but I really love when we get a cool stuff found from a listener that is written by that listener. And so I wanted to kind of come back to this. Uh, Matt says, might I suggest a bill tracker like bill organized or by money master full disclosure? I wrote it. So I'm a bit biased, but I use this to both track my bills. I need to pay by hand and to remind me of bills that are set to auto pay such as subscriptions. So I know when to expect them to be debited from my bank account. Money master won't automatically find the subscriptions that Apple's going to charge you for, but after adding bills to it, it will notify you that you have something due that day. He says, I set mine a day ahead uh, if I want advanced notice on something, and it will give you a summary of upcoming bills on every Sunday. So thanks for sharing that, Matt. And, and th- this is awesome. I, I love it when we can kind of all support each other. So this is good. We'll, uh, of course, put a link to this in the show notes like we do everything else. Pretty good, huh, John? <laughs> No. Oh no, I'm 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 just thinking of what I do, which uh <clears throat> paper file. No. So what I do is I have a calendar entry. Okay. And then in the notes section, I list all of my bills for the month. And most of them are due on the same day, which is nice. Oh, that's and nice. So yeah. I basically do that, check the balance. Usually I pay it off, you know. Uh, all at once, though sometimes I don't, you know, sure, of interest course. and all that. But um, that's my methodology. It's not really that great, though. <laughs> maybe, maybe you know, for two ninety nine, bill organizer from Matt here yeah. might might be the right answer. So, mm-hmm. all right. So, uh, some hardware cool stuff found that I've been playing with here. AU sounds or aw sounds. I'm not exactly sure how I'm supposed to pronounce that now that I'm saying it. I've been using these for a long time, but I haven't said the word. So AUSounds.com, they make all kinds of different uh, audio devices, and I've been looking at their wireless AU Flex ANC, which is their wireless neckband earphones. They're available on their website for $199.95. These things, like they're their whole focus is on high fidelity, which you know matters to me. I'm I'm crazy uh, about this stuff. But man, like these things, they have active noise cancellation. So I'm looking forward to using them on the plane tomorrow. Uh, they have super high res wireless uh, over Bluetooth. Like really, they like they've they've they're using some tech that allows like three times the data 
uh, to be transmitted over Bluetooth. And it does make a difference. And then they run it through uh, a hybrid planar driver so that it's actually got, you know, like there's a driver in there that's that's pushing sound. Man, like these things, it they sound fantastic. So it's really worth if you're if you're looking for like a neck band style earphone, uh, it, check these out. They've got, like I said, noise cancellation and all that stuff. And it's only 200 bucks. So pretty good. So, uh, so I'll throw those out there. And then one thing that I got to play with at CES, John, and now is at least in existence in, in pre-orders and should be coming very, very soon is the SanDisk uh, Ultra Dual Drive Lux USB Type-C flash drive and that the, the, it's a long name i don't know why it goes quite this long but flash drive is what you want to think about here we're all used to flash drives right well they've kind of taken this to the next level this is a flash drive that works over both usb c and usb a it's it's a one piece well it's a two piece device cuz it's got a little spinning cover on it but you can plug it into your USB-C port from one side of it or take it out and plug it into your USB-A port on the other side. Uh, I've been able to get like speeds were were pretty good. Write speeds were even like write speeds. I was getting about 50 megabytes per second. So this is not this is not your your, you know, your old school flash drive. 50 megs a second write speeds, 150 meg megabytes per second read speeds. So like this is a serious flash drive and it comes in uh, sizes up to one terabyte and you can get it from 32 gigs for 11 bucks up to one terabyte for 250 or 249.99. So this is, this is cool because really nice to be able to just plug into your USB C port and not have to worry about finding that adapter that you were talking about, John, but also hand it to somebody that has USB a ports and you're good to go. So that's uh, pretty cool. Nice little, nice little thing to throw in the travel bag. I think so. I share nice speeds too. Yeah, I know. It's pretty good. I was, I was, really yeah, you know, that, that, that's something I noticed. Uh, you and I were doing this at CES, but I was like, you know, I wonder what benchmarks I get on the, uh, on the NVMe, uh, SSD in my new MacBook. Oh, well, yeah. That's, um, yeah. About 2,500 megabytes a second for reads or writes or both. Eh, they're, they're close. Okay. Uh, they're, they're, wow. Yeah. One's a little more, one's a little less, but in general. So I was like, Wow, that's really fast because it's really fast. Yeah, that's good. My old SATA 3 SSD was getting on the order of hundreds of megabytes, whereas here this is thousands. Yeah. yeah. And and I mean, and of course, you know, this this SanDisk flash drive isn't doing thousands, but I mean it's doing hundreds and for a I mean, for a portable flash drive, that's like that's orders of magnitude, or at least one order of magnitude better than the oh, yeah, I wouldn't expect, we would see in the past. Yeah. I wouldn't expect something that small to be able to go at these speeds. Yeah. But, uh, well, why not though? Hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe they'll make one someday. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So pretty cool. All right. Uh, Mitch said, well, he reminds us of something, but it back in show 800, we were talking about ways to keep your network shares mounted. And Mitch reminds us of something we've talked about. He says, I use an app called mountain by app engineers for mounting and unmounting drives. In the preferences uh, under custom, you can also prevent unmounting. Nice app for just five ninety nine, and we'll put a link in the show notes, of course. So you install it on your Mac, and then you can use it to mount and unmount drives. I think it sits up in your menu bar, if I'm if I'm not mistaken on this. Uh, but as he pointed out, you can uh, you can tell it not to let a drive remain unmounted, so it will remount that drive, which is sort of the whole. That was the whole problem we were looking to solve. So thank you for sharing that, Mitch. That's that's a great one. I think we like I said, I think we talked about it before, but never in that way. Two more. Well, kind of three more, but but two more. Uh I've I've long been a fan of the solo uh backpacks, travel bags, whatever you want to call it, solo dash ny.com. At CES, I saw one that I've now finally gotten my hands on. They call it their Grand Travel TSA backpack. Now, the the TSA part is something that lots of their backpacks have. And I'll, I'll just briefly explain the back pocket that your laptop sits in uh, has a zipper or a pair of zippers that allow you to unzip 
it and hinge it wide open so that if you're going through the normal, uh, you know, um, x-ray, not the not if you have pre-check, you don't need to do you don't need to take your laptop out. But if you don't have pre-check, you also now don't have to take your laptop out. You just fold this open and the laptop compartment is left alone. And now you can you can just go through and then just zip it right back up. So that's the TSA part, which is cool. And lots of their backpacks have it. This grand travel part is the thing that really impressed me. It is. It looks like a large laptop bag, um, a little, maybe a little thicker than your standard laptop bag, but not by much, except it's got the, the pocket in the back for the laptop, as we talked about in the front. It's got pockets for, you know, your stuff, your your keys, your pens, your wallet, your, you know, your phone, if you want to throw it in there, your passport, all of that stuff. On the sides, it's got water bottle pockets. So that's great mesh pockets. Uh, on the back, it's got the little straps that slide over your luggage. So all of that. But in the middle, it opens up like a suitcase and it becomes a really good like overnight or maybe two overnight bag. Because it it looks like and is a suitcase inside. It opens up, you know, you, you kind of put it down flat and open it up and it opens up on its side and it has a little, you know, compartment in there that you can put all your stuff into. It's got straps to, you know, compress your clothes down and it's got a little zipper spot for your toiletries and all of that good stuff. And uh, like those trips that I go to your house and, you know, for Pepcom, the quick overnights, those types of things a weekend away, this would be freaking perfect because it just puts it all into one place so um and it's a hundred bucks 99.99 for this thing which is great so anyway i'm excited about it so let's uh we'll put a link in the show notes to it i am the last cool stuff found for today i am the type of person that when i go camping i bring spare tent with me because i like to know that if something has happened or does happen to my tent i have another one it won't surprise you then that when I travel, especially traveling with the family where there's four of us, I bring spare phone with me, too. I also like to have because we do this show and you know we talk about a lot of technology. I also like to have an Android phone around um, to, to use. And so I've all I'm always on the lookout for the, the kind of the right thing to fit both of those um, those scenarios and. I've long been a fan of the Doji phones, D-O-O-G-E-E. -E. And they've got two that are out right now that really kind of blew me away. The S40 is, I mean, it's an Android phone, runs Android 9. It's got, um, you know, it, by ba the base model is 16 gigs of storage, which for a spare phone or a test phone is great. Probably great if you're not doing a ton with the phone either, but it's $110 done. Like go to Amazon, $109.99. You save a, even it's like a penny less than $110. And you've got this dual SIM Android 9 rugged as heck smartphone with a huge battery has like three and a half days of talk time. Right. I know. Like, yes, trust me. I know it's crazy. The world uh, that we live in, it's rugged. It's, you know, weatherproof and all that good stuff. So definitely go check that one out. The Doogie S40 and then uh, their S68 Pro kind of takes it up a level from that. That's twice the price at 220. Uh, it is IP68. It has um, a better camera. It has 128 gigs of RAM, uh, sorry, of storage. So, you know, uh, six gigs of RAM. So, yeah, it's 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 a pretty serious little phone. But again, serious phone like that. Battery life measured in days, like talk time measured, measured in days. And it's 220 bucks. So um, I'll put links to those in the show notes. But if you're if you're looking for like spare phone, it's nice to spend 100 bucks and just have it. Now you're not spending insurance on your iPhone or anything like that. And you've just got something with you and, and all of that good stuff. Now it's, it runs Android, not iOS, obviously. But for some of us geeks, that's actually kind of a nice thing to have around, even if we're Apple geeks. I, I like to be able to experience Android and all of that stuff. And, and there's something. No, there's some things it does better. Like Android's gotten it's gotten way better. Um, it, it, it you laugh at it, but I will ask you, when was the last time you used an Android phone? <sighs> Yesterday. Really? 
Would well, I met a friend of mine and we were talking about um, mm. Pokemon and uh, oh, there like, you can go. I get that on my phone? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. The only thing I notice is that they're, um, they're uh, Google Play, they call it, I guess, is that their app store is kind of like the Wild West or last I checked, maybe they yeah. cleaned it up. But sure. um, downloading something nasty is more likely um, on that side of the fence. At least that's what I like. To Fair. Do. Yeah, that's right. No, no, it's easier, way easier to, to sideload things or load things that are not vetted through the store. And even I mean, the store does some vetting, but it's not the same as Apple. So, yeah, you're right. And Dave Ginsburg points out that on that S40, there's an automatic Amazon coupon for 10 bucks, not automatic. You got to click the box, then it's automatic. So, you, so now it's 99.99, which is pretty good. So thanks for pointing that out, Dave. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Uh, I do want to take a minute though and talk about one other cool thing. And that's from our sponsor, Otherworld Computing. You, you know, I think we even mentioned it in the last show. Their Mercury Elite Pro Dock is so cool. Like, I, I got to see this thing at CES. It is a dock, a Thunderbolt 3 dock that has seven ports of connectivity, right? Two USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports for all your peripherals. Uh, it's got a display port 1.2, so you can add a 4K display on it. It's got a front side SD card reader, right? So you get all your stuff from there. It's got gigabit Ethernet. And then it's got two Thunderbolt 3 ports on it as well. So it's your dock, right? You have this on your desk. It will pass power. So you're good to go. You just plug in and you, you're done. But it's also got two drives in it. So you get a dual drive RAID solution there. And now you're really kind of talking about, well, okay, now you sit down, you plug in at your desk. Not only do you have ports and power you also have storage. And of course, you can get it um, in various sizes up from, you know, well, you can get it empty at zero terabytes all the way up to, you know, 32 terabytes of, uh, of storage. So really cool, nice little sleek design sits right next to your laptop or your um, you could have it, you know, next to your iMac or wh wh however you want it. So you got to check this out. Uh, but Otherworld Computing is the place that you would go to check out things like this anyway, if, if you're going to do what John and I do, because that's what we do. Anytime we need to expand our Macs or add something to our Macs, Otherworld Computing is where we go. So MacSales.com. Remember that. Visit them first like we do. And uh, and check out this, this Mercury Elite Pro Doc. I'll put a link directly to the page about the doc in the show notes, too, so you can, you can see that. And obviously, our thanks to Otherworld Computing for sponsoring this episode. All right. Where are we here, John? Oh, yeah. We had a couple of geek challenges. Let's see if we can get to them both. Two shows ago, uh, we asked about, I, or a listener asked about iTunes for PDFs, ways to manage your PDFs. Uh, and I like the idea of iTunes for PDFs, the, the, the concept really kind of, you know, a, a management system, a place to store them all. Well, we got a lot of responses uh, by far. Devin think sat at the top of this for sure. Uh, and there's a couple of you that, that actually many of you that wrote in about Devin think I'll share Zach's answer here. He says, uh, I think Devin think may be the best out there. It'll handle numerous file types. In addition to PDFs, there's a folder structure, but the search functionality is amazing and allows you to easily find those misfiled documents. There's some pseudo AI functionality that will try to sort documents into folders automatically. And he says it works surprisingly well. He says the system will cloud sync to multiple devices. There's an iOS app available. OCR is built in. If you're scanning software, it doesn't already do it. One of the most handy features for financial documents, he says, is that documents can live in multiple places at once. For instance, when I receive a 1099 from my bank, I can file it in both my Bank of America folder and in my 2019 taxes folder. Only one copy actually exists, but the database allows you to reference it from both locations, kind of like Simlinks, but for PDF. So it really is that takes that iTunes approach, thinking of the folders as playlists, right? I mean, it really kind of goes goes there. So it's a great system, albeit with a bit of a learning curve and a non-insignificant price tag, but I recently purchased the upgrade to version three 
And I feel like it's money well spent. So thank you for sharing that, Zach. That's awesome. Um, Matt also wrote in quite a bit about Devin Think. He says uh, they did a big update to 3.x last year, and it's way better for automation. For instance, he says, I have smart rules set up to watch specific folders for new PDFs. When a PDF shows up, it sees if it has been OCR'd. If not, it OCRs it, then looks at the test and text and moves it into a particular database based on that AI thing that that Zach mentioned. He says it's basically like Hazel with Abby Fine Reader and Spotlight Spotlight on steroids built in. So, um, so that's cool. Thank you, Matt. And um, Adam has two things to mention. He says. Uh, he says I, it, I, there are two preeminent tools in his mind for managing PDFs. The first, of course, Devon Think. The second is Keep It. He says Keep It is new and is simpler than Devon Think. But I had problems syncing between Mac and iOS. Uh, Devon Think has been around for years and is rock solid. But if you don't need to sync to iOS, Keep It works fine and is indeed iTunes for PDFs. So uh, thank you for sharing that, Adam. This is good. Uh, two more. While we're at it here, Patrick says that uh, he uses Calibre to manage PDFs. It's an ebook manager, which is interesting. And other folks mentioned just using Apple's Books app. I think we talked about that during the episode. I think it came up either. Maybe you mentioned oh, yeah. it, John, or maybe somebody in the chat room did. But Calibre is is an app that manages ebooks. And of course, PDFs and ebooks are, you know, often ebooks are often, but not always. Uh, stored in PDF format. So thank you for that, Patrick. And then lastly, uh, listener Dave, not me, Dave, says uh, he likes to use YEP from Ironic Software, Y-E-P, from ironicsoftware.com to manage all of this stuff. It's um, really kind of a, a file management thing, but most definitely will work with PDFs. And uh, it looks interesting. I haven't I haven't messed with it, but but there you go. So Devin Think certainly has the the bulk of the recommendations from folks. They've been around a long time, uh, but there's a couple others. If if you either don't feel you need all that Devin Think offers or uh, want to try something else. So there you go. Any thoughts on that, John, before we uh, before we move on to the next geek challenge? No, I like Devin Think. They, they advertise it as a, a good tool for uh knowledge workers i guess you call it or like if okay. you're doing research and stuff because it's got the, the the search stuff kind of intrigued me mm. and the ai stuff i think is kind of neat yeah that's pretty cool it's pretty cool okay so i i need to point out that we're we, normally we like and now twice in three episodes we'll we'll mention this normally we don't talk about when we record these shows we, we just talk about when we release them uh because of some travel that i have we are recording this episode 803 about 24 hours after 802 was released and in 802 we i i sort of it was it was an off the cuff sort of musing that i wanted some way to manage my uh my 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 the tv shows that i watch like i it's crazy they're spread around over all these services i have no idea i forget that i'm watching certain shows and then, you know, I don't watch them because I don't think to watch them when I sit down to watch TV in 24 hours, really less than 24 hours. You folks poured recommendations on us. I can only imagine what's going to happen over the next six days before this episode's actually released. <laughs> but uh, there was enough more than enough here to to just go through and and at least share this first wave. And, and we'll see where it goes. Uh, great stuff, too. The first is from listener John, uh, who says that uh, I want to start with where he says, he says, with keeping up with shows, I use an Apple TV. I use the TV app and I use the up next feature of the TV app. Netflix doesn't play nice with it, but he says for him, everything else that he watch is he can get to show up there. And the plus, he says, is that it will also show me sports that I have told it that I'm interested in. So my first thought was, well, you know, Comcast doesn't have an Apple TV app. So since so much of the stuff that I watch is, is you know, through my cable subscription, I'm going to hate this. It's not going to work. And then last night I messed around with it for a while. 
And I added every single non Netflix show that I watch to my Apple TV app because I don't have the Comcast app for Apple TV, but I have apps from every other network and plus Hulu and Amazon prime. And, uh, you know, and of course Plex, even though I guess, uh, you know, I don't know if Plex links with the TV app. I don't think it does, but, um, but I was able to link everything else, CBS, all access, all of that stuff right in there. It was a little bit tedious, but not terrible to, you know, add each show as it would be to any system. And then, uh, I went to the last episode of everyone and I did a long press on the app, the last episode, or at least the last episode that I had watched and chose uh, to mark it as watched. It seems like that has now marked all the older episodes as I don't know if it marked them as watched, but it's not surfacing them in up next for me. So, uh, you know, the TV app might actually offer an answer for most of us. It doesn't read from Netflix. So bear that in mind. But if I only have two places to look, that's better than who knows how many I had before. So, okay. So that's one. And thank you, listener John, for uh, sort of nudging me down that path, even when it, I didn't want to walk it. So that was good. Um, but there are, there are others. Listener Lauren says, I use uh, an app or a service called TV time, and it has both a web app and an iOS app at TV It works really well. And I no longer forget about shows for long periods of time. It pulls all of its information from IMDb. So for any shows that are playing overseas and then I'm coming, then are coming here later to the U S they'll show up with whatever the earliest release date is. So that's a little annoying and you have to manually enter your shows. Uh, it is definitely the best option that I found that isn't just making a spreadsheet. Um, that's crazy big and almost unreadable. So thank you, Lauren. Yeah, I agree. The spreadsheet option is no bueno, but it, uh, it's better than nothing. But these seem to be better than spreadsheet, so that's good. Um, Watch Aid TV Planner is what Brian recommends. It has an app for iOS and an app for TVOS. Uh, he says it lets you track all your shows, even uh, long canceled shows and, of course, current shows. He says, I believe the app is free. I've tipped the developer who has been terrific, terrific at keeping the database up to date. So thank you for that, Brian. Uh, Curtis recommends something called next episode, which is at next dash episode dot net. It is free. It is agnostic. I .e. it doesn't care about broadcast cable or streaming it has granular notifications. And he says it tracks movie release dates too. So there you go. Of course, links to all these are in the show notes. You don't have to remember it. You don't have to take notes, but you can, if you want, um, let's see. And then, uh, and I screwed this up earlier today, but, um, Felipe uh, recommends the real good guide, uh, R E E L good streaming guide. So we will put that in there. And then John D F recommends the TV show tracker iOS app. And we'll put both of those uh, in the, well, we'll put all these links to all of them in the, in the show notes. So good stuff. Thank you for all of the answers. I can't believe how much came in so quickly, but you know, it's how it goes. It's fine. It's great. In fact, it's more than fine. It's fantastic. I'm just a little worried. That I'm going to come back from this trip to Mexico and, and find my inbox overflowing with yet more <laughs> recommendations because most of you haven't heard these by the time uh, you're sending them in. So there you go. Any thoughts on that, John, before we add a couple more tips before we head out of here? Um, doing a Google search surprisingly more often than not brings up information. I, I saw the other day on my, uh, to-do list walking dead and I'm like, Oh, that's starting up again. Yeah. And, uh, if you search for walking dead, it actually said, Oh yeah, here, um, this episode is, uh, is, uh, going to be showing at this, this time <laughs> date and time. And I'm like, Oh, excellent. Okay. Cause every now and then I, I noticed that TiVo thinks something is new when it's not. Right. It eventually clears it out. I, I don't know if you've noticed this on occasion. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that before. Sure. Yeah. 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 I don't want to have to search Google because the whole point no. is I don't want to, I don't want to have to remember what show it is. I want to, I, you know, right, the right. list of shows that I want to watch, but you're right. I mean, the, the data is out there. It's just a little bit of a pain in the neck. So yeah. Oh yeah. And, and well, now we got a, <laughs> a laundry a plethora list. of, yeah. um, 
apps that do this. Yeah, well. I'm curious to see how I like using the Apple TV app. The interesting part about it is as soon as I set it up, I said to Lisa and, and Lucas, my son, I was like, hey, you know, maybe we can cut the cord here. And of course, Lucas was very quick to point out. He's like, well, where do we get like, don't you have to log in with your Xfinity account in order to get all these shows via their apps on Apple TV? And other than the CBS all access stuff with like Picard, uh, that is mostly true. So mm, might not be so quick to uh, to cut the cord, but maybe you never know. You never know. Hey, um, speaking of service providers that we love and hate, um, it's worth checking your cell phone providers plans on a regular basis. Of course, there's always mintmobile.com slash MGG. If you're ready to head down that path, it's like and I, I recommend checking it out, but um, this isn't a sponsor read. That's just off the off the cuff. I want to make sure everybody's you know aware of that. But um, check your cell phone providers plan once every six months or so. Check the plan that you have and compare it with the new plans that they offer because they change things constantly. Now, sometimes you will find that the plan you have no longer exists, but they'll let you keep it because you're grandfathered in. And, you know, sometimes that's cheaper. There's a reason that they've expired it. You know, maybe, you know, it was too good of a deal. But um, that's the reason you want to look every six months or so is just go check that out and see, is there another plan that's going to save you money or maybe for the same amount of money, give you more features or faster speeds? You know, they're, uh, all the providers are adding 5G now. Well, your plan that you have from four years ago might not support 5G and maybe it doesn't support things like uh, the uh, like like personal hotspot. I was helping somebody with a, an AT&T plan and they had, you know, an older plan. It was grandfathered, not uh, didn't have hotspot, didn't have, uh, you know, 5G or anything like that. And for a family of like six, they, you know, they could spend an extra five dollars total per month. And get faster speeds and personal hotspot and all of that stuff. But AT&T doesn't send them an email saying you should check our new plans that we've rolled out. So you just got to do it. Just do it on a regular basis and do it with all, you know, with all your providers, because, you know, you're probably uh, not getting the deal that, you know, you should be getting. So, like I said, we Mint Mobile is an ongoing sponsor here at, at, at MGG, and that's a great option, too. But whatever provider you're using, check out the plan and compare it to what's currently available. You might be pleasantly surprised at the very least. You'll be pleasantly surprised that you have the best deal. And it's like, Hey, all right, that's cool, but maybe not. So, yeah. Yeah. I was surprised. I think it was about six months ago, but they sent me something. Uh, Verizon sent me something saying, Hey, you know what? You know that two gig a month plan that you have? Well, for five bucks more, you can get five gigs of data a month. Right. And I'm like, oh, okay, thank right. you. And then they did a rewards now. So they have, uh, I think they call it Verizon Up Awards. Sure. And every month you get one award point. Well, one thing you can cash it in for is an additional gig of data. So I'm actually at the point now. And they do carryover. So right now I have nine gigs of data on my phone. Nice. That's great. Because I kept applying all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, good advice. They're always coming out with new stuff. There's new stuff. They should be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Um, two quick tips. One, they aren't quick tips, but I think they'll go quickly. Uh, Steve says, I saw this shortcut recipe to automatically mute the iPhone volume upon setting do not disturb. It might help those embarrassing sound leaks. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Thank you, Steve. It's just a shortcut that you can build in the shortcuts app. Uh, on iOS and and then you're good to go. So thank you for that. We will put put that link in the show notes. And then Andrew sent in a note about how he says the folks at OWC recently posted a newsletter with a lot of great tips. And one that caught my eye is a post that shows how to easily put an alias for your iCloud drive into the dock. So we'll link to that as well, too. And thank you, Andrew, for uh, for sending that along. Fun stuff. Good episode. You know, it's, um, it's crazy doing an episode 24 hours after the last one came out. But uh, but, you know, here you go. So 
don't get any ideas, folks. I don't think we can we can we can't do like daily hour long yeah. episodes of the show. I don't I don't know that that's a good idea. <laughs> I only got one day off, man. I know, but now you but now you like we don't record mm-hmm. again for like another week and a half. So it's, we get yeah. some, we both get a little vacation, which uh, is nice. Maybe I'll go on a cruise or something. Uh, you could. It's a it's a good time of year to go on a cruise. We're we're going oh, down to wait, we're going no, down to Mexico. No, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> no, sure it is. Cruises are well, great. Some people are are but some people are stuck on their boats because of oh. uh, the, 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 the the coronavirus. Coronavirus. Yeah. yeah. I did buy travel insurance for our trip to Mexico. I mean, I would have bought travel insurance anyway, but um, it's nice knowing that I have it for uh, for this. It's it's it, we're going to see fish. So by the time you all hear this, except for those of you in the chat room, by the time you all hear this, it will I'll be on my way home. But. Um, but we're going to see fish. It's like this, you know, they play four nights at this resort down in Mexico. And so it'll be a nice little getaway for Lisa and I. But um, but I for those types of trips or for a cruise uh, where, you know, you're you're sort of spending all your money up front uh, before you leave. I've it, travel insurance is usually pretty cheap uh, and and worth getting. And especially with, you know, coronavirus and, and, and all of that. I was like, yeah, you never know if they're just going to pull the plug on this thing like they did with mobile world congress did you see that they canceled mobile world congress it's supposed to start on the 24th was supposed to start on the 24th unlike the 12th or maybe the 13th they were just like yep that's it sony and the amazon had pulled out the day before because so many people that go to mwc come from china so sony and amazon were like yeah no 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 no, no bueno and uh, the next Is day in spain it's in barcelona that's correct Yep. Yeah. Oh, yep. Okay. That's right. Yep. Oh, so, I guess yeah. They just don't want. But can you a lot imagine of people packed in a tight space? Oh, total. Well, and a lot of people from China packed in with a lot of other people in a tight space. Like the the risk factor was too high, and companies were bailing out. Mm-hmm. So they were like, I mean, they have one hundred and ten thousand people come to Mobile World Congress. Well, last year was one hundred and nine thousand. So my guess is they didn't want to have a showing of like. 40,000 people at Mobile World Congress. Better, the optics on that are not good, you know, so much better to just say, yep, we're going to cancel, we'll see you next year. But, I mean, A, it screws up all those hotel rooms, it screws up all those people that paid for flights that probably aren't getting money back, and, although some of them probably are, and then um, it screws up the mobile phone industry because there's so many things that were going to be announced at this. And now, you know, it's like, well, how do we how do we generate the press attention and, and you know, all of the all of that stuff? So it an, creates an interesting scenario. So anyway, I just I throw that out there for it makes it interesting. All right. Well, that's what we got. Thank you to everyone who listens. Thank you to all of our sponsors, as we mentioned during the show. Zapier.com slash MGG. Z-A-P-I-E-R.com slash MGG. Linode.com slash MGG. And, of course, MacSales.com. Uh, our ongoing sponsors, yes, we mentioned MintMobile.com slash MGG. Uh, of course, SmileSoftware.com slash podcast, barebones.com, Eero.com slash MGG. In fact, you can go to MacGeekGab.com slash sponsors and see all of our active sponsors there. And we keep that up to date for you. So go check that out. That's what you. That's what we want you to do. Just go there. Don't worry about anything else. Just MacGeekGab.com slash sponsors and uh, go check it out. Click on the ones that interest you. You don't have to buy. That's between you and them. But... We do try to generate awareness. Dave, John. I said it once and I'll say it again. In the last episode, I told you, since you're going down south, that you should do one thing. And the fact that you are listening to this now must mean that Dave didn't get caught. Made up. You know, there's no guarantee of that because I'm going to set this to publish before we uh, before we leave. So oh, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. No, so maybe maybe the get next stuck episode. In Mexico. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. That's uh, uh, who knows. Who knows? We gotcha.